If you're looking to make money online with an internet-based business, then you're watching the right video. Now this is part two. Essentially, if you missed the first part, I suggest pausing this video and then finding the part one. It'll be linked in the description below. Now, part one discusses physical product businesses and also content businesses. But in this video today, I'm gonna to talk about all the other types of businesses and other different ways to make money online with these passive online internet-based businesses. So starting off with the first business in this video is info products. Now these other types of business models I absolutely love and I really like digital product businesses because they're very easy to scale. You can upfront a big portion of the work and then you can just focus on scaling the business and comparatively versus physical product businesses, you're gonna have a physical product but it's going to cost you a lot more to create that business or that product. It's gonna cost you a lot more to essentially manufacture that product, get it over to the US, send it over. With digital products, you're gonna have a much higher margin. You're gonna be able to send it to somebody instantly. And the best examples for info products are going to be eBooks, uh, digital courses or online courses, membership websites where you're paying a fee to actually access part of the, the website. So these are some great ways to make money online and I love info products. One of the great things about info products is it doesn't take a lot of capital to get started with an ebook, with a membership site, or even with a online course, you don't really need that much. If you have an iPhone and you have the knowledge and kind of know-how, you can kind of get started with building your own program or your own course. Of course, the hard part is going to be marketing that program, marketing that book, or marketing that online membership site. So that's gonna be the difficult part and that's where a big portion of the, the advertising spend or marketing budget is going to need to be allocated to. So if you're able to know how to do the initial part, you can go ahead and make an info product and then outsource or figure out how to do the marketing yourself. But a lot of times that's gonna take a bit of time. It's gonna take a little bit more money to figure that aspect out. So making money with info products is fairly straightforward. If you have an ebook, you're selling it for $10. Uh, essentially, if you're selling it through Amazon, it's gonna, they're gonna take a little bit of cut. If you're selling it through your own website, you're gonna get 100% of that margin. And the same thing for online courses. If you have an online course, you're selling it through somewhere like Skillshare, they're gonna take a percentage of every sale. But if you're selling it through your own membership site or your own website, you're gonna essentially get 100% of those margins. So online products are gonna have a lot higher margins because you can control more of the fees, you can control the actual fulfillment, and you're gonna have instantaneous downloads and a really high chance to scale because one of the things that I see with physical products is they run out of inventory. In the busy season, they find it very difficult to calculate so with this, you can scale you know, either one product a day or a million products a day. With a digital product, it doesn't really matter. With a physical product, you're eventually gonna run out of inventory and you're gonna have to wait months to get that inventory replenished. So the last thing to know is, again, a lot of these businesses are gonna take some upfront work, but once you have these businesses up and running, you're able to outsource a lot of the aspects. Maybe it's the marketing, maybe it's the sales or the actual maintenance of the, the info product. But again, it's gonna be a fairly passive business model once you have it up and running. So Amazon KDP is the next business. This is something that I've actually built myself with my best-selling book, Global Career, How to Work Anywhere and Travel Forever. So they have a way to actually fulfill physical books through Amazon KDP. You can go ahead and get a physical copy of my book on there, or you can actually get the digital version. And that's what a lot of people do with KDP is they're creating just a digital version, they're able to sell it on Amazon, and they're essentially able to get a percentage of money. Depending on what price point you're selling it at, you're gonna get a different royalty for that. So if you're selling your book at 99 cents, you're not gonna get nearly as much money as if you're selling it for 7.99, 9.99. So Amazon KDP or Kindle Direct Publishing is essentially going to require you to create some sort of book. So once you have your book on KDP, if you write it yourself, you do everything yourself, it's gonna be fairly cheap to get up and running. But if you outsource to a marketing agency or you have a publishing company helping you out, it might be a little bit more in depth. 
because there's a lot of self-publishing on Amazon, but there's also a lot of big companies and big publishing companies presenting and selling their books on Amazon. So it's really gonna vary in regards to your startup cost, but if you're able to write a book yourself, you can essentially get started for fairly cheap. So again, with KDP, once you have the book written, you figured out the marketing strategy, again, that front work might take you six months, a year, it took me a year and a half to finish my book and get it up and running. So it can take a lot of time, but now it's a very passive income stream for me. You don't really have to do much because it's on Amazon, they're generating traffic to my book page and people are buying and purchasing this book at all hours of the day. So the next business is SaaS and another very great business model. SaaS stands for software as a service. And this is essentially going to be any type of software that you've used, you're paying money for. This is gonna be a product like that. So one of the products that I love to use is HubSpot. HubSpot is a software CRM or a SaaS CRM. Uh, this is going to be essentially a marketing tool, a place to manage your customers. Uh, it's also gonna have a lot of other features involved in it, but there's a million different types of software products. So the reason I love software products and SaaS businesses is because they're very hard to replicate. You usually don't have a ton of competitors. They're also going to be a really great high margin business, meaning you're just selling a digital product essentially. You're selling the software product, and then the other thing is, I love these businesses, again, because you're gonna have monthly recurring subscribers or customers, so usually with SaaS businesses, you're agreeing to pay X amount of dollars every month, so instead of having to get one customer and then they stop, they never buy from you again, they're essentially buying from you every month and you're able to create a foundation of subscribers that you can just build upon each month and it kind of accumulates over time and it really has this big snowball effect. It's one of the reasons that I love software businesses. So one of the real reasons a lot of people don't get involved with SaaS businesses is one, it can take a lot of time and money to build a software business. You one need the idea, you're gonna need developers to build the product and a lot of times people are intimidated by this because they think the deceptive value is going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars to build their software business, but that isn't necessarily always true. Now the startup costs are going to vary extremely depending on what type of software business you're wanting to create. The Silicon Valley way might cost you millions of dollars. The bootstrap way might cost you a couple thousands of dollars to get started with a legitimate software business that can generate 10, 20, $30,000 a month in net profit. So the way software businesses make money is essentially you're going to have your product and you're gonna charge a monthly subscription or a yearly subscription, or in some cases just a one-time fee. But in most cases, it's gonna be monthly recurring subscribers or customers that are gonna be paying you to access your software. Now for the example I used earlier, HubSpot, you're gonna get free access to that and then you're gonna have different add-ons or tiers. So if you wanna use the free version, that costs no money at all. But if you wanna actually get more contacts, if you wanna use some of their pro features, you're gonna to have to pay a monthly subscription to use that software. So software businesses, again, are gonna vary in passiveness. A lot of times you're gonna need a customer service representative. You're probably gonna need somebody on your sales and marketing team that are gonna be running the business and getting people to buy your software. But again, I've seen some very passive software businesses and I own a software business that I only spend about one hour per month because I've outsourced all the other aspects of the business. So it can really vary, but they can be structured in a way to be fairly passive. So Amazon Merch is another great way. If you've heard of Teespring, Zazzle, any of these print-on-demand t-shirt generators, essentially Amazon has created a version of their own and it's called Amazon Merch. You can go ahead and upload your own designs to Amazon Merch and then people can buy these t-shirts through Amazon's own platform. So you wanna start off with figuring out what's popular on Amazon, what are some of the most sold t-shirts, and essentially figuring out how can you replicate and improve upon that. Maybe the design isn't very good or trendy and you're able to put something that's a lot nicer, a lot more cool, a lot more trendy, and you're able to upload those same types of images and essentially sell a better product. So Amazon Merch gives you a lot of opportunities, but it's going to be one of these things that requires a lot of trial and error. For example, if you upload 100 different t-shirt designs, 
there's probably only gonna be two or three that are actually popular. But once you figure out those two or three, you might become a little bit better at figuring out what customers are actually wanting on Amazon Merch and creating more similar designs to the ones that are becoming very popular. So the great thing about Amazon Merch is there's not a lot of startup costs. All you need is somebody who can design these images and essentially create these t-shirt designs for you. So if you know how to do it yourself, it can be free, but if you need to outsource a designer, the great thing about design work is it's not that expensive. Usually one or two designs is gonna cost between five or $10 each on the low end, maybe $50 on the higher end per design. So how this business makes money with Amazon Merch, you're essentially going to be paying Amazon a commission. They're gonna be printing the t-shirts, they're gonna be fulfilling it. So for every t-shirt you sell, you're gonna get a portion or a cut, and then Amazon is gonna get their portion or cut in the business. If you sell a t-shirt for $20, you might get a pretty small commission, but it's gonna be about five or $6, but really Amazon's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. They have to supply the shirt, the fulfillment, all the customer service, all these other things, where you're essentially just supplying them with the design. So Amazon Merch is a very passive business. You're going to essentially just be adding new designs to your Amazon Merch account. Once those designs are there, you don't really have to do any maintenance because Amazon is taking care of a lot of the, the heavy lifting. So service businesses can be a very wide variety. Some of the examples that come to mind are like an ad agency or some type of content agency, but let's stick with ad agencies. So essentially somebody who's running Facebook advertisements, you're paying them a fee for actually running your Facebook advertisements and they're essentially doing all that work for you. This is a great business model, but it's usually gonna require a little bit more time and building a larger team of people. So a lot of agencies are gonna usually have a higher headcount than a typical dropshipping business or a content business. So the startup costs, what I've seen in a lot of agencies, is usually pretty low. You essentially have some sort of skill that you're going to create in your agency. Maybe it's Facebook ads, maybe it's SEO, maybe it's just general marketing. So you usually have that skill and you're able to bring on clients. So a client comes to you, you're able to fulfill them with Facebook advertisements. And that's just the one-to-one -one starting point where you're just trading your time, you're helping them run these Facebook ads. Once you get a few more clients, you start outsourcing those to other hires and that kind of builds a team where instead of doing the fulfillment yourself, you're just managing your team or your agency. And that is the most common trajectory I've seen with most agencies. They start small and continue scaling their team and to actually reduce how much time they're having to spend fulfilling the actual product because they've outsourced that to their own employees. So the way agencies make money typically is you're, they're providing you a service and you're paying them money. So let's say a customer is, has a new business but knows nothing about Facebook ads. They'll pay this agency $2,000 a month to run Facebook ads for them. There's usually a percentage of the income or the revenue or the ad spend that's being tacked on top of that. So let's say for example, it's $2,000 a month retainer and then 10% of ad spend. So if they spend you know, $30,000, they're gonna essentially get 10% of that for the ad spend plus the $2,000 retainer. So ad agencies definitely require a lot more work compared to some of these businesses, but if you structure it and build the team in the right way, where you're essentially outsourcing and hiring for a replacement for yourself, they can be fairly passive, but in most cases, they're gonna require a lot more work than the other businesses that we've discussed here today. So applications are gonna be essentially what we refer to apps. So if you have an iPhone or Android phone, you have apps that you use every day, and essentially these apps are going to sometimes be monetized. So these applications can be a video game, they can be a social media platform, or they can just be a service. So the cool thing about applications is there's a lot of different cool ways to make money. And for example, the App Store for iOS and for Android has a lot of organic traffic. So you can go ahead and submit your app there. And if you have a really good or really popular idea, it can get a lot of organic traffic. The normal business model I've seen with applications is normally the freemium business model. Freemium meaning that the app is gonna be free, but there's gonna be pro features. Maybe you just run ads and you're making money through ads. The pro feature will get them to remove the ads, but they'll have to pay an additional expense for that. 
So some other ways are free video games, but you have to pay money for upgrades and to get other cool items for your characters. There's a lot of cool ways to make money with apps, but it's normally a freemium business model where only five to 10% of your total customers are actually paying for the application. So startup costs with applications can be quite high, especially if you're trying to get your app developed in the United States. A lot of people outsource that to overseas because they can get deliver high quality applications for a lot lower price. In the United States, probably gonna run 50 to $100,000 to develop an app, but if you hire outside of the United States, it might be a lot lower, 10, $15,000. So there's definitely a lot of startup costs that go into building an application. So that's why I think it's a pretty good industry to get involved in if you have a really great idea. Maybe the idea has already been proven and established. So once you have that in mind, you'll have a lot more confidence in knowing that it's gonna be worthwhile to make that investment to build an application. So applications are fairly passive because essentially once you've built the app, all you have to worry about is kind of maintaining it, doing any updates, making sure that the app is not having any bugs. Of course, there's gonna be a few other things that go into the business, but in general, a lot of apps are gonna be fairly passive. So the next business model is the subscription business model, and I guarantee you're already paying for some of these businesses. So Netflix, Spotify are two of the big ones that come to mind. Essentially, you're getting a product from them. You're getting to listen to music without ads. You're getting to stream videos and TV shows. And essentially, you're paying them a monthly subscription fee to have access to this music, to have access to TV shows and videos. So that's essentially what the subscription business model is. There's gonna be other things that are in the subscription too, which is like, for example, a wine club. So maybe every month you're getting certain wines sent to your house. That's another common subscription, but you're paying every month for some sort of product or service. So the startup costs for subscriptions are going to vary a lot. If you're a business that's sending wine to everyone, that might be a little bit easier to get started than to build a whole platform to manage TV shows and movies, but there's a lot of different subscription models out there. One of the cool ones that I love, it's called Scotch Cheap Flights. They actually send you cheap flight deals and you pay a monthly subscription for that. And again, they also take advantage of the freemium model where they have a free version and then around 10 or 15% of people are, are opting into the paid version. So these subscription models are great because once they're up and running, once they have a team, it's really gonna vary on, on the type of business model that you pick, the type of subscription that you build, but I've seen some fairly passive subscription businesses. Now the last business on the list is lead generation, and this is a fairly unique business model. I don't see a lot of people talking about this, but essentially there's a few different ways to make money with this business. You're essentially going to be ranking on Google, generating leads, and then selling those leads. One of the common ways is, let's say you're a dentist in a local area and you're wanting to get more leads for your dental practice, but you just don't understand marketing. Maybe I go out and I figure out St. Louis Dentals and I'm ranking number one on Google because I'm really good at SEO. What I can do is I can sell those leads to local dentists and then they can actually reach out and target those people. But it might get even more specific than that. So maybe you're targeting a very specific county and you're generating leads for that county to then sell to dentists. So there's a lot of different ways to build a lead generation site, and there's a lot of ways to monetize this, but essentially some industries are going to pay you a lot more per lead. And a lead might just be the email, the name, the phone number, and for each lead, they might pay you a dollar. In some instances, I've seen where they've paid up to $50, and this is normally gonna be in the home mortgage niche where for every lead that has filled out an application, you can essentially sell that lead to somebody that's gonna pay between 25 to $50. So the startup costs for a lead generation business are gonna be fairly similar to that of a content business. You're gonna need a domain, you're gonna need hosting, and you're gonna need content. And then lastly, you're gonna to need to figure out a way to start ranking this website on Google. So other than that, it doesn't require a lot of cost. I've seen some lead generation sites and businesses that only require $500 to $1,000 to get started. Sometimes if they have the know-how themselves, they can do everything and do it for a lot cheaper than that. So once lead generation businesses are up and running, they are fairly passive because they're essentially ranking for certain keywords. 
and these keywords are generating leads at large scales. And then essentially it's an automated system to sell these leads to people who are going to pay for each one of the leads. So thank you so much for sticking around. If you have a business model that I missed, make sure to leave a comment below. And if you made it this far, don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the bell notification icon to get notified about when I'm publishing new videos. I'm putting out videos every week, so make sure you subscribe and thanks again for sticking around. And if you're interested in buying or selling online businesses, I'm gonna leave a link below in the description where you can find out how I can help you with a free consultation to either buy an already established profitable online business or if you're a business owner, I can help you sell your online business for the maximum profit.